packages in the mail. And of course, <laughs> when you're uh, in chameleons, the packages become extra interesting. Let's see how we go here. Do, 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 do. So let's see what we got in the mail. I got actually got two things. They're kind of interesting. So let's see. All right. All right. My Simpton uh, Black Soldier Flies. I actually have a, a subscription to these guys. So let's see. Can you see? So if anybody... I don't want to get this in my coffee. That would be <laughs> that would be a, a rough way to start the morning. Let's see if we can see. There we go. Oh yeah. Oh hey. Whoa 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 whoa. <laughs> it's getting a little bit wild over here at the Chameleon Academy. So uh, yeah. So uh, these guys, my Christatus back there, are big enough to uh, take these little. Boy, I'm not going to be able to show it. These uh, black soldier flies, nice, filled with calcium. And uh, if they get away in the cage, no problem. They turn into black soldier flies, the actual things that fly. And uh, the chameleons love to get them then. So, hello, Elise. Very good to see everybody here. And uh, I'm very glad to see that uh, my one weekend off uh, didn't send everybody uh, running to the iguana groups and saying, forget this chameleon stuff. <laughs> it's very good to see you here. And I uh, got another got another package in. Let's see if you guys can recognize what this is for. What? Okay, I got to get, get that, that out. All right. All right. You can put in the comments, what do you think this is? Hmm. Obviously, it's got the... The, uh, the style of uh, sunset chameleons, but it's not the feeder that they usually usually make. So this is actually a planter. And so you can put a little plant in here and you can have a nice uh, nice looking uh, pot. Now it's not it's not huge, so it's uh, really good for accent plants. And I'm always uh, I'm always up for making the cage look beautiful for you as well once you once you've made it functional for your chameleon you got to make it enjoyable for you and so uh this this kind of thing is perfect i love both prayer plants and trades condentia i think that's what it's called it used to be called wandering jew but we're now changing that sensitivities and such uh but uh, there's so many different varieties and they are beautiful and so you get these little cups like this, and I can put like five different varieties on a wall and have a, a collection wall. Let's see, uh, Lisa's saying, been using the uh, RBG mix on both my enclosures, but Atticus has his morning substrate fix. Hello, Emerald Garrett. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, has his morning substrate fix. At least you mean these uh, yeah, by eating the substrate. <laughs> That's uh, uh, okay. Uh, you just put details in the comment section. This is a uh, this is a free flowing conversation question and answer section. So go ahead, put whatever you want in the comment section. We'll talk about it. The main topic that I'm getting into is bioactive uh, situation, bioactive substrates for chameleons, and this is something that we. We don't, in the chameleon com uh, uh, community, uh, we, we don't talk too much about uh, by, uh, substrates because chameleons are in the trees. But it's it's actually uh, been very useful in, uh, in breeding some rare chameleon species like the jeweled chameleon that uh, we weren't able to breed before. And so it's opening up a whole new, whole new world for us to explore. So uh, you know, not going to change much of the veiled chameleon, panther chameleon, Jackson's chameleon. But uh, it's opening up doors in some of the uh, a little bit more rare species. And uh, for those of you who, you know, there's people that keep chameleons and they want to keep chameleons uh, well. And uh, uh, but then there's some people that use it as they, they kind of they feel chameleon herpeticulture is their art. And, and that's that's me. 
And so we just dive into all these different aspects so we can understand all aspects of chameleon herpeticulture. So let's see. <laughs> oh, this is from a Facebook user. Yeah, Facebook doesn't allow me to put on uh, who you are. So you are now a Facebook user. Uh, plants are beautiful. Looking at the $300 bill for plants I just bought in a chameleon upgrade. <laughs> um, I know what you mean. That is exactly what happened this weekend when I came away with a $300 bill for a lot of real cool plants. Uh, and it's it's a lot of fun. I'm getting ready to build some some enclosures and I got to get those special plants. So good morning, Matthew. So, I, well, you know, I want to ask, go ahead, and put it in the comment section. Uh, what do you guys think of this bioactive stuff? It's something we chameleon keepers normally don't run into. Uh, is it something that exciting for you are you uh, intimidated by it are you confused as to why we're why we're getting involved with it at all uh what, what are your thoughts on this whole bioactive thing uh oh, let me know put it in the comments let's let's talk about bioactive christine says she's had a chameleon and bioactive enclosure for four years now excellent excellent <laughs> Emerald Garrett's buying plants again. Oh, let's see if I can go back here into my little nursery. So here are two plants that are uh, two different of the uh, Trades Condensia, formerly Wandering Jew, that uh, I've been working with. This is the little pink panther. Uh, the, these leaves turn nicely pink when they're in the, the good light. And this one... I just picked this one up because I never heard about it before. Um, I'm going to have to try to get some better light on it to see if anything comes out of it besides just green leaves. Because although the green leaves are nice, that's not what I got that kind of plant for. Um, uh, Lisa has just started using bioactive and is having problems keeping plants alive yeah that's a that's a problem with a lot of uh, a lot of chameleon keepers although it's interesting you have a bioactive uh substrate and do you have any idea why your plants are uh, are dying do you think it's uh water lack of light pests that get in there let's see oh emerald garrett's saying the same thing my plants and cleaning crew keep dying Maybe I just have a black thumb and should actually feed the cleanup crew. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah, everybody's got their own situation. And some people, the plants just grow for them. And then some people, the plants just don't. And it's sometimes it's hard to tell the situation. I've got a <clears throat> uh, someone who works with me on Facebook named Alicia. And oh, she has the hardest time keeping a pothos alive. And we're all trying to, it's a, it's my lifeline project to figure out how we can get her so uh, she actually keeps her pothos alive. <laughs> and we're going to work on that. Uh, Jarek says, think you really need a good LED UVB setup for your plants to thrive. Well, light's very important. You definitely need to get light somehow. It could be LEDs, 6,500Ks, whatever it takes to uh, get that uh, light to the plant. Um, <laughs> oh, yes, I like this. Emerald Garrett is keeping the plant business alive. You know what? You are the cornerstone of our economy. And I, I we are grateful to you for your service. Um, let's see. This is an interesting one from uh, Nick. Love watching my Caesar shoot his tongue into the pot plants. He likes his dirt, bioactive soil in the pot, plant pots. Yeah, that just uh, that's just not the not typical chameleon behavior. Are they, is he going after the um, the cleanup crew or something in there? Yeah, this uh, chameleon's eating substrate that's it's called geophagia for all those who want to uh, really slay at uh, Scrabble, uh, and that's eating soil. And some soils are actually nutritious, and humans do it in some countries where soil is nutritious. 
Uh, and it, it, you're just not sure why chameleons do it. And uh, is it they need the nutrients, but uh, you got people that are supplementing and they, they chameleons still eat the substrate. Uh, we don't, I don't know why. We don't know why and don't know how to stop them or you know you can give them more supplements but if that doesn't stop them i mean what can it be so yeah it, and you know chameleons are individuals each one they've got their crazy little quirks and we just got to figure it out got to figure it out oh well here's an interesting one christine says my pothos is the only plant i have problems with <laughs> Does that just go show you the the diversity that we all run into the uh, the photos the one that most people that's the only thing they can keep alive, and uh, and this is the one that she has a problem with. Yep, I mean, uh, such is life, such is life. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see what we have. Uh, Ches saying. Cam started walking really slow, but he just started shedding and won't drink at all. Okay, not sure what's going on there. There seems to be a, a whole lot more to that story. Uh, this is a difficult medium to uh, dive into that situation. If you want to go to my Instagram account and just laid out the entire situation, I can see if I can uh, come up with something. But... Um, yeah, that, that's going to take a little digging into to see what's going on. And let's see. Jarek's uh, saying, my female veil eats lots of hibiscus leaves, not the flowers. Well, that's interesting. That's interesting that she eats the leaves instead of the flowers. Uh, usually, they, they tend to like the flowers, which, you know, they're nice, attractive flowers. So... <laughs> You know, there, there's just, you see, this is why it's really hard being an educator in the chameleon community, because I got to come up with stuff like, like care sheets and podcast episodes and articles for the webpage. And I know that I have to do an article that covers 90% of the cases, 90, 95% of the cases, but there's always that 5% that is just way out there, totally uh, going against everything that a chameleon should be or uh, other chameleons do. And so, I mean, there's always that 5% that mess everything up. <laughs> it, can't, it can never be easy. Um, uh, let's see. I'm going to do, I've got a real long, long post from a Facebook user. It's gonna, I'm going to just scan it real quick. Um, okay. Uh, first bioactive turned into a swamp because drainage layer wasn't working um yeah okay but there's okay by the way drainage layer yeah this is uh a drainage layer is where we start to see the benefit of um and and i this isn't necessarily this is just a, a topic a catalyst for the topic uh so facebook user i don't know if this is your situation but uh us moving forward in chameleon herpeticulture is worthwhile for many different reasons and the hydration of chameleons in a bioactive is uh we, we find success with the natural progression of our exploration of fogging like i know in the community when fogging first came up there was this whole pushback uh, and from people who now identify themselves as day misters and it's like a political position now uh and the thing is, you have to figure out if you want to progress beyond the screen cage, you have to figure out the holistic hydration approach. Like you can't day mist your bioactive enclosures enough that the chameleon gets what they need as far as water without being in danger of uh, saturating the substrate. But if you learn how to use fogging, you don't have to miss that much to uh, to hydrate your chameleon. You can uh, utilize uh, uh, fogging to a great degree, and then your mist can just be the topping off. And at which point you have you don't have a danger of saturating the soil. And so, uh, by being able to get into the bioactive 
clay cages, it's opened up uh, success for so many different species. And so this is why it's important for us to push our husbandry forward, even if what we're doing right now is working for the situation we're in. Uh, if we never explored fogging, then we wouldn't wouldn't be having the success we're having right now with the smaller species and the bioactives. It's a skill that needs to be brought forward and has different applications. And so this is this is why it's important. Uh, you know, if something's working for you, you can stick with it for the rest of your life. That's fine. But don't be threatened by it. Don't be threatened by other people going forward and exploring you can just sit back and say okay i'm i'm not going to go along with it because i like what i'm doing it's working uh, i'm good that's fine that's fine let other people go forward but but don't fight against progress and that, that's my general public service announcement here um let's see facebook user uh recently added a grow light i can't put the question up because it's too long uh, I've noticed that my chameleon prefers sitting under it to the UVB. Never bothered with a grow light. Picture plant. Oh. Okay, I'm not sure what the question is. Uh, you know, Facebook user, could you um, uh, consolidate all everything you wrote into a uh, a shorter question? It's just really hard for me to really dive into long long uh, comments. Uh, just as the nature of going live here. Uh, Ruthless says, have you done bioactive with baby chameleons? Yes. Yes. It's perfect for baby chameleons. Oh my goodness. It is so good for baby chameleons. Uh, and what kind of plants? I look for plants that uh, that have small stems, like Scheffler is good. Even ficus is good because they have the small stems that the chameleons can climb on. You want the leaves. Uh, but also you want the uh, the small, the real small perching branches. And I uh, go and listen to that uh, interview that I did with Michael uh, Nash just a, a couple months ago, where we talked about uh, baby chameleons in the naturalistic and bioactive situation. Uh, it's it's a huge. Uh, this is a wonderful skill. And to let you know, I, I actually have a follow up with Michael Nash. And next Saturday, Mike, uh, actually, it's not next Saturday. Uh, next weekend, I have to move this to Sunday. Sorry for everybody. But uh, I'm, that's when Michael Nash was available. And next week, you're going to hear a lot where me and Michael Nash are putting together a build guide for your bioactive. And so we'll have a shopping list, build guide. And so you can just follow along. And then at the end of the week, Michael's going to come on and we're going to talk about it. And you can ask whatever questions you want. Uh, but yes, bioactive baby, baby chameleons, it's, uh, uh, it's a game changer. It really is. Here we go. Christopher says, hey, hey, hello all. Okay, we need a little sunshine in the morning. Hello. Oh, Matthew's asking, I can keep any plant other than pothos a lot. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I don't know. We're, it's, it's amazing how all of our situations are different. Uh, so Christopher has an absolute mess of lights and cables above uh, the Reptor Breeze. What does everybody do to tidy this up? <clears throat> um, get cable ties, tie them all together. Uh, you can even uh, attach, put little hooks in the wall. But yeah, it's a good idea to pull it all together, to try to make it look nice. And putting it all on top of a, a Reptor Breeze, really challenging. Now, I did a... I did a video on YouTube here about uh, the, the ca chameleon cage top. And so you can take a look at that and you can see what I did. Um, it, it didn't look that bad, but yeah, it's kind of hard to <laughs> have everything we need in it not look and it look good up there. Um, Byron's asking, do you have a good recommendation for the backing board of a naturalistic background? Styrofoam. I, there's just so many things you can get a, uh, you can get a picture like petbackdrops.com. They'll get a picture that you can just hang up on the back of your cage. Uh, you can put cork bark, uh, or just, uh, have, uh, a vines. I, I like to put, have plants grow up, plants grow up and vines go down. 
yeah, it's, there's no real easy solution to that. Um, let's see. Okay, okay. People are helping other people in the chat. I love that. I love that. Oh, Emerald Garrett. Panther loves passion flower, but only a certain part. Which, and he likes the violet ones. Interesting, which part? I really want to know which part uh, of the passion flower he's eating. That's interesting. What the heck? You know you've hit the big time when Pete Hawkins joins you. Hello, Pete. Very good to see you. Um, here we go. Pete says he or, uh, utilizes the overnight foggy method for crusties, Brazilian rainbow boas, as well as the cams. Yeah, uh, I I think I mean we're everything we learn here in the Chameleon Academy. I mean chameleons are just part of the reptile world, and all of these reptiles they get this high humidity. I mean I won't say all the reptiles. Many of these reptiles get this high humidity at night, and so this is just the naturalistic flow. It's not just for chameleons, and uh, I think. For all of you who are diving deep into chameleon husbandry, I mean, you're listening to this podcast, you're watching the videos, you're getting, I mean, I focus on chameleons, that's my niche, but it's amazing how much that translates, what we learn here translates to the other reptiles to the point where I, I find when I take a look at another reptile, it's like, I'm so, uh, so intimidated because like an emerald tree boy. I hate, oh, I haven't, this is so different from a chameleon. And I find out it's really not. It really is not. And yeah, there's a couple of differences uh, on, the, on the feeding and the habits and such, but they live in the arboreal uh, rainforest as well. And uh, they're under the same kind of natural conditions. So what you learn here is very applicable out in the in the outside world. All right, let's see what else we've got here. Um, what the heck? Matthew's asking a very interesting question. Has anybody done this before? Modified the bottom part of the reptibris to use a cedar wood planter box and then mount the reptibris on top of it. <laughs> Matthew, I've been doing that for years and years and years, and that is... It's incredibly successful for your outdoor, especially your outdoor keeping. I have, uh, you can look through the, uh, some of the, my history there. I call them planter box cages. And I actually have the planter box on wheels. And so, and then a two by two by four foot screen cage on top of it. And I have, and I just wheel it around. During the summer, I make sure that they're in the place where they get morning sun, but they're shielded from the afternoon sun during the winter. I'm moving them out there where they have uh, the, the right kind of whatever sun they can get. And when the weather is just too bad, uh, either way, I roll them into the garage. And it's incredibly convenient. In fact, I mean, I'll give you a sneak peek. Uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be doing a, a series on what you can do with screen cages. And that's one of the things. And so you, you just hang around here. And you'll you'll see it, but yes, that's a great idea. Let's see. Destruction warehouse says mouth gaping while shedding is normal, right? Well, depends on what kind of gaping they're doing. Yes, they will they will open like mouth like a big yawn to try to break the skin up, and so that's normal. That's normal. Now, gaping like you would in a respiratory respiratory infection, that's not normal. But, uh, yeah, so you, you just got to be, uh, just watch it. Just watch it. Um, okay, Jarrett did the uh, the planter box thing, put the box inside. Uh, I'll say the advantage of having it on the outside is you can have the box as deep as you want it, and you don't use up your cage space. Uh, and I just, I just literally screw the cage. What I do is... I use the uh, the plastic floor that comes with the cage, and that is the floor of my planter box. So I have a nice, uh, you know, drill some holes, and then I put as many layers of wall on there uh, that I want. Usually it's a, a foot, 
and then I put the cage on top and I literally just screw the cage down onto the, the wood planter and uh, it it's, works quite nicely. Mm -hmm. All right. So Facebook user put on a grow light and the chameleon seemed to want to go up and hang out under the grow light. Uh, yeah, you want to figure out why your chameleon is going under that grow light. What is it they're looking for? Uh, you make sure that the chameleon has what they need. So obviously, I don't know the situation. So my my advice is very high level. Uh, but yeah. Uh, is there a way to keep my chameleon from shoving his head in the pitcher plant? Wow. Uh, what is he going after? What is he doing? <laughs> Oh boy, that's that's why I love these chameleons. I I don't have an answer. I have no idea. I've never heard that behavior again. Very interesting. Is he going after bugs? <laughs> why is he doing that? Oh, let's see. Daniel, Daniel says that Michael Nash is awesome at teaching and what he does. Daniel, you are a wise man. You have a very good uh, discernment. He is awesome. He's been, and did you know he just had, uh, released a paper on UVB and the raising of carpet chameleons and found that UV index of three is effective. Uh, and uh, UV index, is it six or seven? I think it's seven he went to. Uh, you, you need to go up that high. So uh, oh, this is a great example of how the community is really stepping up to the plate and we're doing things. Uh, we're doing things differently. We're learning. We're building our community. It's awesome. Oh, boy. Christopher Ch uh, Churchill is wondering, where should we be measuring humidity inside the enclosure? Um, everywhere. The Your enclosure, if done properly, is a series of microclimates. And so you're going to have different humidity levels all over the place. And so if you're going to be measuring humidity... Uh, you can just pick one basking branch and make sure that that basking branch is at that level. And then the rest of the cage is going to have, uh, depending on how big your cage is, it may or may not have a whole lot of difference, but I, I would just pick one basking branch. Um, but it's really going to be a gradient, um, and a microclimates. I don't know if I explained that right. Let's see. See, Annie's asking, what's the best way to sanitize outdoor vines and branches? I don't. Um, there's, uh, I don't discourage people from doing it because it makes them feel better, but I don't. There's, I mean, never, I've not had a problem and I've not heard of anybody who's really had a problem. I know a lot of people like to do the sanitization because it makes them feel better, uh, but oh, I'll say I don't. I don't. In fact, I like it to have a little bit of a life to it. And, uh, but uh, do what makes you feel good. If you, some people like to put them in big ovens and some people like to bo put them in boiling water, um, you know, even a, a bleach solution. But the thing is, when you're doing that, you're starting to do strange things to the stuff you're putting into your chameleon cage. And you have to, uh, you have to decide whether what you're doing to it, like bleaching it and such, is worse than whatever you think is coming with the uh, the branch. Um, and parasites, depending on where you are, North American parasites aren't going to be necessarily compatible with chameleons. Um, and so, I, you know, what, what danger is there? Really, what are you trying to protect against? Uh, and then make a judgment as to what's what's more important um let's see hello richard richards saying good morning good morning thank you bill will be setting my new dragon strand soon excellent and maybe we'll go bioactive now one thing that'll uh be a challenge with uh, the dragon strand and that's uh what he's talking about it's a two by two by four foot cage unless i don't know which one you got. i think that's one i i don't know uh, i also have the four by two by four foot 
Uh, the pro the uh, challenge with a four foot tall cage is getting enough light down to the bottom. So, uh, and although the lights will go down to the bottom, the lights we have, you get some powerful lights that will go down to the bottom. The problem is when we have a chameleon like a panther chameleon, Jackson's chameleon, failed chameleon, we need to give them uh, plant cover to hide behind. And so that's that's usually in the, the middle section of the cage, uh, which is all good and fine, except that will block off a lot of light coming to the bottom. And so uh, you're in this, this uh, the balance between how much do I give them this cover that they need, uh, knowing that the more cover I give them, the less light I'm getting down below. So uh, it, it's... Now, I would say give the cover and then uh, for bioactive, uh, get, get another cage like these leap cages. I'm going to be talking about these a lot next week. I really like them and I think they're uh, a, a very nice tool for uh, for uh, the chameleon community to really get into this, this bioactive. Uh, so I'm going to be talking a lot about them next week. Um, Uh, let's see. Christopher has been reading Reddit. And once again, yeah, that you've got a, a little, you've got a corner of the chameleon world that likes to give chameleons uh, water through glasses. No, I don't recommend that. It's going against their, their nature. Yes, you can train some chameleons to do it, especially veiled chameleons. But, uh, I, I don't, I don't like uh, methods that require the chameleon to change what they are for our convenience. Um, you know, there's only so much you can do. They are in captivity. They've got to adjust, but I, I see absolutely no reason to make it more difficult and require this out of them. So no, I don't, I don't go that direction at all. And I don't see any reason to, it's not even a, uh, a, a, a valid option, uh, in my book. So it's just one little corner of Reddit that, that seems to be uh, uh, lost in time. Let's see. Okay, Emerald Garrett is part between. Oh, this is the uh, the part that the um, that her panther chameleon is eating from the passion flower, <laughs> and it looks like. Uh, her panther chameleon is just picking and choosing parts of the passion flower. That is interesting. That is interesting. All right. The Corona filaments, she said. Okay. See, Elise is saying, I still don't fog, but I use a sprayer twice a day. Okay. However, the only way Atticus, new name is Mr. Sprinkles, still only drinks with a hand dropper or hand sprayer. So that's interesting. <clears throat> Wonder if that's a habit. I mean, chameleons pick up habits. They really do. They're they're smart enough to pick up habits. They adjust to their situation. And so, um, and depending upon the species, uh, panther chameleons, veiled chameleons, they tend to adjust more than some of the other species. But yeah, that's interesting. Uh, you have any idea where that started? Um, and does it does it come up to the uh, the hand dripper or hand sprayer, or do you have to present it to him and he just drinks when it's presented to him? So I, I, it'd be interesting to explore this habit of his. Let's see. Annie is rescued and Ankarami with burns. What is the best remedy to help? Well, it depends on how are they open wounds. If they're open wounds, then yeah, antibiotics. Uh, I, you know, I'm not going to give vet advice here. I'd say you take it to the vet, but uh, they'll probably have some burn cream, uh, silvadine, depending upon how how um, how new they are. Uh, if they're scabbed over and you've got their scarred over then you just leave it because it's healed on its own uh but uh yeah so it depends on how how fresh it is a, a burn is is just like a, a a wound 
and so they're treated like wounds and uh, but you got to make sure that the chameleon is stable and it depends on how how much of the body is burned if it's just a little bit little burn then they can recover from that if it's a lot uh, it may need some real veterinary assistance there how much of the year do i use outdoor enclosures in california all year round uh depending upon the species and some species easily live year round outdoors veiled chameleons jackson's chameleons uh helmeted chameleons uh, elliot's uh, and there's a lot of chameleons that will live outdoors year round and and the reason why i can do that is even though it gets very cold during the the winter i mean anybody else is uh, is scoffing right now uh our cold of occasionally we get down into the 30s um so it's we're, we're i'm not in a position where it gets too cold for chameleons but the reason why they can handle even going down to the 30s at night is because the days are clear we, we don't have a whole lot of rain here for better or for worse uh and so the chameleons almost always have a clear day with sunlight that they can warm up and so that it, it means the cool nights they don't have and there's no problem with it now if you're in an area where it's overcast for the entire week and cold then the chameleon's not going to be able to warm up and properly function so uh yeah i'm, I'm lucky in that regard let's see okay so this is uh the panther chameleon that likes to put his head in the pitch plant and i'm assuming we're talking about a nepenthes tropical pitcher plant because that i can't imagine uh i'd be very impressed if you were able to grow a north american pitcher plant big enough that a chameleon could put his head in it uh inside of a vivarium uh but uh tropical nepenthes yeah yeah and this is strange why in the world when he put his head inside of a strange dude strange dude but you gotta love him you gotta love him um we're asking any experience recommendations using the terrarium to automate enclosure conditions the terrarium pie uh that may be something i'm not familiar with terrarium pie but there's all sorts of uh controllers that you can use that regulate the temperature and the humidity uh, and the one problem I have with those controllers, which I use some of them and they work great for what they are. The one problem is that these usually do not allow you to set, um, a different humidity for night and day. Uh, you, you have to get special ones that do, uh, I did find one and I'm not sure. Yeah, I forget which one it was. Um, but uh, I'm looking into them and soon uh, I'm evaluating them. I know Zoomed has one, uh, although that one I believe doesn't allow you a nighttime humidity setting, but I'll, I'll check. Uh, and so that's, that's really what's important is a nighttime humidity setting and a daytime humidity setting. Uh, and, and I'm uh, checking into some that do, and I'll give you a product review once I'm done. Uh, but yeah, in the home automation center uh, uh, systems, yeah, go for it. They, they work very well. You just have to set them up properly, of course. Let's see. What the heck? The shop. Oh, my goodness. And this is the shop. It's summer. Hello. And summer was on uh the episode where we talked about making uh an outdoor cage and the shop is going to be at the reptile super show and i hope to bump into them and i can't wait um and so it's going to be fun I, i'm going to be going to the reptile super show uh in a couple of hours and we'll uh get to see a bunch of interesting people and yeah i'll be live streaming and doing stuff like that. anyway I'll be looking for you. Let's see. Well, what the heck? Got John Courtney Smith joining here. Uh, the, the, my audience just gets uh, better and better here. 
Um, let's see. And he says, uh, this is the Ankarami panther chameleon that has uh, scabs uh, or it has burns. And she, uh, she says they look scabbed over. Um, okay. Well, if the chameleon is looks like they're active and they have recovered and there's no pus in the wound, then you, you may be home free. They may, uh, may heal fully on their own. You just have to be cognizant and really look at it carefully. If there's any hint of infection or, or lethargy in your chameleon, you got to get it to the vet. Uh, as quick as possible, because those things will go downhill so quickly, especially with uh, with injuries like this. So uh, if they look like they're doing good, they're eating, drinking, walking around, eyes are alert, then you can just watch it and make sure it continues to heal and doesn't puss up. Uh, but at the first sign of trouble, or if they're not active and alert, uh, get to the vet and get that because it, it'll sneak up on sneak up on you and all of a sudden, boom, they're dead. Um, this is, it's because we humans, we ignore those subtle, those, those subtle signs. And in we humans, uh, we, we will complain when it gets, when we start getting more and more pain, chameleons won't complain. They'll, they'll hide it. So we have to be extra sensitive. Let's see. Uh, Christopher says, uh, he's got a, a weather app. To mimic exact dawn dusk cycles to the to Yemen itself, that's fine. Uh, just make sure you don't uh, hook up any temperatures to what you see on Yemen. I don't know if that technology is there. Uh, dawn and dusk, I mean that's fine, but um, uh, just make sure you don't you don't uh, use the temperatures and humidities from Yemen. Now. You may say, well, wait a minute, <laughs> isn't that the basis of all your care summaries? Yes, it is. It is that the uh, temperatures and humidities and the readings coming from the weather station in Yemen is not in the microclimates that the chameleons are hanging out in. So you're getting what it would be if the chameleon was hanging out at the weather station in the open, which is not what they're doing. Uh, just like every animal, they've got so many microclimates that they hide in and there's thick foliage that those chameleons are hiding in. So they're not getting the temperatures and humidities. Uh, they're not being exposed to that. Now, looking at all those uh, measurements, temperatures and humidities are useful to us because it gives us a magnitude of what they're, uh, what they're working with. Uh, but do not replicate those conditions in the confines of a small barbarian. Yeah. Let's see. John is uh, is talking about uh, helping with the burns, and it's great seeing you guys talk talk in the uh, the chat. Um, so, all right, let's see. We've got a a show goer, Ace. We've got a Sambava. From camouflage, not looking to buy. <laughs> yeah, me neither. Yeah. Let's see. Eventually look for a female panther to uh, breed. Okay, excellent. And it says patience and due diligence is key in this hobby. Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Uh, Ace is asking if I'll be going tomorrow. I don't know. I'm not planning on it, but I've been known to change my mind. Uh, I have a huge filling schedule that I need to get to. Um, so I'm saying right now, I probably won't be there tomorrow, uh, but I'm not making any promises because I know me. And yeah, I love the show. <laughs> uh, let's see. Daniel's asking, is it better to gradually lower temperatures at night? Because it kind of just blasts the AC, it lights off. Uh... I don't have any information that uh, that tells how quickly the nighttime drop should occur. Um, and when you say blast the AC, it lights off. Do you mean into the room? 
or into the cage. Into the cage, that would be a problem. Into the room, you know, chameleons fall asleep pretty quickly when it comes to uh, when they start closing your eyes and the uh, lights go out. So I don't think that there's going to be a problem with a quick drop. I think a, I mean, if you just walk outside, that's what they're looking for. Uh, we don't, I, I don't know how much tolerance they have for going outside of that. Although I suspect it's quite, uh, quite a large tolerance. I don't think there's a problem when you're uh, lowering the temperature of, uh, of the room. Um, now, if you have a, if you have a screen cage, that might be a problem because you've got a cold draft and a blast of cold air, which probably isn't good for them, a blast of cold, dry air. So if it's you're in a screen cage and the air conditioning is pointing at the cage, I would, I would be nervous about that. Um, but as far as the overall ambient temperature dropping the rate that it would take for an air conditioner to cool a room, a standard air conditioner in a standard room. It, I don't think that would be a problem. Yeah. Okay. Daniel's adding, uh, just into the room. So, uh, you know, as long as the, the air is not hitting, it's not a draft on the chameleon. I, I think you're fine. I think you're fine. Are darkling beetles okay to feed to a veil? Yeah. They'll eat them. Yeah, no problem. Uh, some some chameleons like them, and some chameleons refuse to eat them. So you just just see what they uh, see what they say. What the heck, Jonathan Hill is here. <laughs> hey, I've got all sorts of great people. Uh, very good to see you, Jonathan. You should fly out and come to the show. <laughs> of course, across the United States. <laughs> oh. Um, oh, wait a minute. Give me a second. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Emerald Garrett saying, a new chameleon sometimes sits with one eye closed. Oh, no. That checked is okay. Also acts chameleon like, but he had ideas why he does that. Well, yeah. You, you take a look at the behavior and you just got to figure out why they have their eyes closed or one eye closed. Uh, I I have had seen chameleons outside where they'll they'll sit and bask, but they'll have the one eye that is uh, pointing to the sun. They'll have that closed. And of course, I freak out. Ah, what's going on? And I look on the other side and they're just looking at me going, Shh, what's your problem, dude? And, and then they open their other eye to look at me and figure out what this crazy hairless ape is doing dancing outside of their cage. But um, and, and they're just closing it because they, they want to bask, be in the sun, and they don't want to be looking in the sun. So, I mean, things like that, that's not sickness. And so if there's a breeze or something that uh, they're just closing their eye for comfort, then, then I don't, not a problem. So, yes, I have seen that before. And uh, not a problem. Let's see. Elise has a fake tree in her living room, and... Uh, is it okay for them to hang out there a lot? Uh, well, you got to be careful. Free range. I don't like free range. Uh, number one, because it's hard for them to get their UVB and all that other stuff of what they need. And also because it's just so many opportunities for uh, accidents to happen. So I, I, I frown on that and I, I generally discourage it, tell people not to do it and just assume that the people who are really diligent about figuring everything out uh, will get to the point that they're not asking me. So that's what I've done it before and I, I know the challenges. Uh, as, as for the AC on, here's the problem with uh, air conditioning. It's dry air and it's a cold breeze. And so both of those things on a chameleon are not good. So you just have to, where is the tree within the room? And is it getting blasted by air conditioning? Uh, so you just have to make that judgment call there in the, in the moment. Best bugs for bioactive. Isopods and springtails are the standards. They work very well together. Uh, but I know people throw in earthworms, they throw in black soldier flies, they throw in 
super worms. They throw in all sorts of stuff. Uh, so, uh, you know, you can experiment with it. Just be careful that nothing is going to harm your chameleon. Let's see, Jarek, uh, this, this is a question as to chameleons, uh, if you can feed veiled chameleons of darkling beetles. I assume we're talking about the ones from super worms or mealworms. And yeah, good, good. Glad they're enjoying it. Uh, I would love it for my chameleons. My chameleons ignore those beetles. They don't like them. But uh, it's just a personal taste of the chameleon. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. There you go. Red wigglers. All sorts of stuff. It's amazing, you know, start off with the isopods and the springtails, but it's amazing the kind of things that you can throw into this bioactive. I mean, it it's just supposed to be a replication of the earth and there's so much out there. So uh, once you once you figure it out and uh, get a couple of bioactive builds under you and you're keeping them, maintaining them, I, the world's your oyster. You can expand however you want. It's very interesting. See, Annie's saying, I have a Parsons that likes to wait for night callers at evening time. Are these okay for them? Yeah, they like them. Um, I don't I don't see a reason why that would be a problem. Or does she actually do you give them to her or does she actually hunt them? <laughs> That's Annie, please let me know. Do you give night crawlers to your Parsons or does your Parsons actually hunt? And wait for night crawlers and hunt them and then go back because that would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, let me know, please. She hunts them. Oh, that is so awesome. I love it. I love it. That's perfect. Chameleons have so much character. It's uh and I think this is something for us in the community to explore more and more is uh enrichment. Uh, and coming from, I mean, I'm, I'm all for, okay, give your chameleon security. And so your, uh, you, you know, hybrid cages and such, but, uh, uh, the high enrichment is something we need to start thinking more about. And, uh, so yeah, we're always growing. Um, any tips on having females lay in bioactive setups? Uh, the, the only if you're going to have is uh, them being able to dig in the soil and generally the, the bioactive uh, soils are light and fluffy. And so they're easy to work, uh, dig in. And um, as long as she can dig in them, it's fine. Now, uh, one thing you've got to embrace is that chameleons don't need depth, uh, anything more than four inches to lay their eggs. And so don't give them more than that, especially in a soil that's not going to hold a tunnel. Um, so, and so bioactives definitely won't hold a tunnel, but they're usually not more than three or four inches deep. So you should be fine. Um, there are some chameleons, uh, the smaller chameleons, where we have problems with them. We haven't figured out why they spread eggs around the surface. They're just not happy with something. And so we still have a lot of growth to go in like panther chameleons. I just had a first for minor that I was so happy because she made it and it was an infertile clutch that she spread all over the cage. <sighs> I, you know what? I've tried so hard with minor for so many years. I don't know what it is about my particular situation, but I got to fix it. <sighs> Genevieve, thank you. Thank you for joining here. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Um, Yeah, here we go. Ben uh, has had some millipede-like creatures that have taken up residence along with the isopods and springtails. Um, yeah, sometimes they can get out of hand. So uh, yeah, keep an eye on that. But yeah, we especially when you bring in things from the wild, it's interesting what all of a sudden shows up. Um, yeah, you, you have the... You're deciding be behind uh, between... Uh, sterilizing it, boiling it in water, and and losing a lot of the stuff on it that makes it uh, bioactive uh, and be totally, quote, safe. And then 
you let in whatever's on there. So you, know, you make sure you, there's no ants on it. You make sure there's no black fungus or really bad stuff on it. Actually, the uh, the episode that I just released, I released this video uh, interview with uh, Josh Halter, Bio Dude. I just released it here on YouTube. And uh, we talk about that, bringing things in from the outside, the the, uh, the advantages, the dangers, and the, the benefits, and just talked about what you do with those things. Um, let's see. Oh, wow, we've got a lot of discussion in here. Let's see. Hey, Zurbrick, what plant should I give you my chameleon? Go on chameleonacademy.com backslash plants, and you're going to find a, uh, a whole web page about plants that are appropriate for chameleons. These aren't this this is this list isn't something that I took off of a dog and cat plant list poison list and called it a chameleon list. It's uh, I have a list on chameleonacademy.com backslash plants that is actually plants that have been used with chameleons, and I even have veiled safe put on the ones where we actually where we have uh, instances of veiled eating it with no ill effects. Yeah. See you, John. Thank you for joining in. Oh my goodness, we have very good questions. What are some of the big husbandry parameters that we should rethink a bit with bioactive? Um, we don't have to rethink the parameters, but we do have to be careful as to how we execute them. Because uh, historically in the community, we've come out of screen cage husbandry. And the problem with screen cage husbandry is you, you are fighting against the entire room. So your humidity and your heat, it just dissipates so quickly because you're really heating and humidifying the entire room. Uh, and so we have an entire generation of chameleon husbandry people, care sheets and such that are built on the idea that you can't overcome the ambient conditions. And so you can just blast in the cage and there's no consequences. So that is the big thing that we need to rein back and start to get a hold of. And by the way, that, that works with screen cages. I mean, it works. Uh, but now we have to be careful how much um, how much uh, heat we put into the system because the cage is, will retain our heat. We have to be careful about how much we missed in the system because uh, all of that water stays in the cage. It doesn't just drain off. Um, and even though like the cages I have back there, they have uh, drainage trays. But I don't have any holes in those cages. I mean, that's just because I always work with drainage trays and it's the safest thing to do. But I have to really look at how much water goes into the system. Now, this is worth it because it's amazing. That you, 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 you tend to you start to realize how much water we've wasted trying to hydrate chameleons that are in screen cages. Um, and that's, you know, I'll, I'll put that out there and I hope all the screen cage people will listen and say, Hey, okay, there's another world out there. Um, but you know, if, <laughs> if I just have to talk to the new generation of people, then so be it. Um, but, uh, so we have to be careful about how we use our tools. That's the big change with bioactive. Uh, the actually having the uh, the bioactive soil in there, the only thing that really does as far as the parameters is increase the humidity. And that's that's significant for your smaller chameleons. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'm just, uh, let's see, I'll leave it at that. Yes. Uh, to... Someone's feeding crickets and 
Looks like Jonathan is. Uh... Oh, okay. Jonathan is uh, having a discussion. <laughs> Excellent. You're you guys are in good hands with uh, Jonathan. Um. So anyway, is anybody in here going to the show today? I mean, these are for this is a Southern California thing. If you're in Southern California. Uh, we've got a sh uh, the, our biggest show of the year happening in Anaheim. And uh, if anybody is is going, I'm going to be there, and I'm going to uh, have a meetup at 2 p.m. at the Leap booth. Those are the guys who made these cages, and um, and I'm going to be talking a lot about them next week. But uh, I went, went uh, there while well, everybody was uh, setting up and uh, helped uh, brought some plants for the Leap booth. And I was able to talk to Tim and he agreed, yeah, go ahead, have a meetup. So we're going to have a 2 p.m. meetup at the Leap booth today and just allow me to put a, put faces to the screen names. And, uh, and do me a favor when you come up and introduce yourself, uh, let me know what your screen name is. And I'm going to try to remember names. Uh, this is, uh, it's been great being able to see a number of the, the names uh, come back. Uh, week after week, and uh, it's really good seeing you. So, all right, next week we are going to go deep into bioactive and how to do it. And of course, since this is the Chameleon Academy, we're going to be uh, understanding what's going on. And we've started with the the podcast episode that I released yesterday, where is a big long interview with Josh Halter, the bio dude, about the substrate. What is in the substrate, and why is it important? And so. Uh, we're starting at the ground level, and we're going to be uh, going through that, the uh, a whole build guide uh, for the next week, which is going to culminate in a Sunday morning uh, interview, live interview here with Michael Nash. So I'm moving next weekend. This show right here, this interview here goes to Sunday uh, just for that one weekend because that's when Michael is available. So I hope hope you all can... Uh, can adjust with that change. Uh, I try to not, I try to be as consistent as possible with as little change as possible, but every now and then when you got like uh, you got good people from Europe or uh, you got someone that's just great to talk to, you have to adjust for their schedule. So uh, anyway, I want to say thank you very much for joining here today. And uh, I'm gonna sign off here and we're going to, we are gonna really hit it hard uh, next, next week and you're going to be you know check out the the youtube videos because there's going to be um a lot of activity here in the youtube channel and so you're going to be seeing a lot of uh videos that are meant to go one after another and the wonderful thing about youtube is it allows me to put an end screen where i can link to the next video in line so you don't have to go searching through and making sure you don't miss one you can just go from video to video to video. And as soon as the next one releases, I can go to the previous one and put a link to the latest video. And so it's a great system. And doing short videos really works well for me. Um, I really like it. And I hope you're enjoying that system too. Going little little uh, daily touch points. Uh, it, I, I really enjoy it. So anyway, Ashley, you just joined us. <laughs> well. Uh, well, I hope you'll be able to uh, join next week. Uh, next week will be Sunday at 8 a.m. Pacific time. So have a good weekend, everybody.